Hi, I'm Christopher King. I'm a uh, I'm the associate medical director of the Advanced Lung Disease and Lung Transplant Program at Inova Fairfax Hospital in Falls Church, Virginia, and I'm here to talk with you a little bit today about how we approach uh, outpatient uh, therapies and and sort of risk stratify patients that are that test positive for COVID and sort of uh, determining you know who is an appropriate candidate for antiviral therapies. And, and how we select which, which therapies uh, we're going to give. And so um, it's a pretty common scenario that I uh, get faced with uh, day to day. You know, um, we have, I deal with a population of patients that all have lung disease. Uh, many of them are immune suppressed. Lung transplant patients are on immunosuppressants for underlying interstitial lung disease. And so for me, it's a bit higher risk population, um, but uh, it's not infrequently that, um, you know, the patient's develop symptoms, they know they have an exposure or just know that, that COVID is prevalent in the community. They take a home kit, uh, uh, test kit, and they call in and they say, you know, I've tested positive for COVID. What do I do now? And so I think the first thing you really need to do is to figure out, you know, what uh, is the patient um, in need of admission or, or an emergency room visit? Because there's a lot of issues with just bringing every patient in uh, to be seen. You know, there you know you have healthy patients in the waiting room, and so it's uh, you run the risk of infecting a lot of other people. Um, you know, the patients actually have to travel to the hospital or to a clinic appointment. Um, and so they can infect people along the way. So there's a lot of issues with just bringing all these patients in. Many of these patients won't require urgent medical attention. And so, um, you know, you're trying to figure out, are these patients uh, sick enough to, to need to come in, I think is step one. And so uh, there are some patient self-assessment tools that are available online. Um, there's some links that are available um, that that we can uh, that patients can be provided, and they can go through these questions. Or these are questions that could be asked by your nursing staff when they call in, or if you're the one speaking with the patient. You know, do they have significant dyspnea, um, so or shortness of breath? Um, so you know, it's not uncommon for patients to have some degree of mild shortness of breath. Say, you know when climbing a flight of stairs, they might might feel a little bit winded, but they really shouldn't feel winded doing, uh, you know, physical activity uh, that's that's just sort of activities of daily living. Um, so if they're developing, you know, significant shortness of breath, if they're lightheaded or dizzy, if they have intractable nausea and vomiting, confusion, anything like that, those patients should probably come in and be seen. Um, and, uh, you know, patients should continue to monitor because they may test positive early on and more severe respiratory symptoms can develop, you know, three, four or five days into their illness. Um, if patients have a, a pulse oximeter, monitoring that on, a, you know, a periodic basis through the course of their illness is not unreasonable. And if they uh, have an oxygen saturation less than 95 percent, I would recommend those patients uh, come to the emergency room to to seek a evaluation, and they may benefit, uh, you know, in the end from from an admission and uh, and further treatment. Um, but most of the patients are are not going to have severe dyspnea. They're not going to uh, to require urgent medical attention, uh, particularly since uh, the Omicron variant has become the pr uh, predominant uh, variant in the U.S. It seems like patients' uh, severity of illness, even though there's a, there's a lot of patients getting infected in the community, the severity of illness has decreased uh, significantly from the alpha and the delta variants that we were dealing with early on, where we had just a number of patients come to the hospital with severe uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome and uh, being admitted. Um, so now I think a lot of the difficulty comes in, you know, how do we determine who these patients are that are at risk uh, for progression to severe disease? And so there's a number of risk factors um, that are that we can display um, that um, that are range anywhere from things that are fairly common, like obesity, a BMI greater than 30, um, you know, chronic lung disease, uh, asthma, chronic uh, heart disease. Uh, age uh, is a factor. So if, if there are anyone age 65 or higher, um, you know, uh, in addition to a number of other, you know, use of uh, um, immunosuppressing medications, uh, all those patients are at risk uh, of progressing to severe disease. I would also say patients that are unvaccinated, um, those patients uh, would be at a greater risk uh, of progression to severe disease. 
Uh, and those are the patients that you may consider uh, using uh, an antiviral medication in. Um, so when we're thinking about antiviral medications, there's a number of choices available now, and it's um, uh, difficult to know sort of how best to deploy these things. I think in general, um, uh, Paxlovid, which is uh, uh, an oral uh, antiviral pill, um, is probably the first line therapy for the vast majority of patients. Now, you have to keep in mind there's a number of drug-drug interactions um, with uh with this medication. And so patients' uh, medication list should be scrutinized pretty carefully to make sure uh, that, that they're not going to have an interaction. And I think the consideration needs to be, is it something like a, like a statin for hyperlipidemia that can be stopped transiently while the patient's on Paxlovid? Or is it a more significant medication like, like Prograf, uh, which is an immune suppressing agent that really can't be stopped um, without some forethought in, in a transplant patient? Um, because if they have one of those um, medical interaction or drug-drug interactions that really precludes use of Paxlovid, I would move on to a, a different therapy. And, and I think the therapy that I would move to next uh, would be monoclonal antibody therapy. Uh, now, there's been a number of monoclonal antibodies that were available. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them do not have significant activity against the most prevalent circulating strains uh, that we're seeing right now. And so right now, Bebtilivimab uh, uh, is the only one that's effective against the Omicron BA2 um, uh, variant. And, and so uh, is really the, the monoclonal antibody of choice. Uh, some of the other uh, monoclonal antibodies like Sotrivimab um, that we were using earlier for Omicron variant now have lost effectiveness. And so um, I think most uh, hospital or, or clinic-based uh, clinics that, are, that provide monoclonal antibodies are, are fairly in tune with, with what's going on uh, in terms of which um, subvariants are circulating and, and which uh, of these monoclonal antibodies um, you know, are, will be effective. Um, you know, unfortunately, also not everyone has access to a monoclonal antibody uh, clinic. Uh, and so if that's not available, um, other things to consider um, might be um, remdesivir. Um, so remdesivir can be delivered as an outpatient uh, in an outpatient setting. Uh, the downside with this treatment is that it's a three-day therapy, so it requires patients to come back uh, for multiple visits. Um, but, but that may be an, an option for patients that don't have access to or have a contraindication to taking Paxlovid uh, and, uh, and don't have access to uh, monoclonal antibodies. So for patients that uh, have a contraindication to Paxlovid, don't have access to remdesivir or monoclonal antibodies, another option would be high, uh, high titer convalescent plasma. And so this is, you know, pooled plasma uh, from patients that have been infected with COVID. And there's some data that suggests a reduced risk of hospitalization or death. Um, and, and so this would be an option, although again, it's not uh, widely available. I think, uh, you know, the enthusiasm for uh, use of convalescent plasma dampened uh, based on some of the earlier data. And so uh, not, a, not a lot of places are, uh, have convalescent plasma programs now. Um, but it is an option in, in some patients, and, um, and uh, there is some data to support its use. Um, I guess after um, that, I think the, and the final agent worth mentioning is uh, molnupiravir, uh, which is an oral um, antiviral. Uh, the, the data for its use is not quite as compelling uh, as for Paxlovid, and so I think if you have the option uh, to use Paxlovid, I would I would certainly go with that, um, you know, barring some uh, contraindication. Um, but uh, for patients that uh, maybe don't want to go somewhere for, uh, you know, monoclonals or and you know remdesivir convalescent plasma, where where they're going to have to have an infusion, leave, uh, you know, and stay in a healthcare setting for a time, um, you know, and and have some contraindication to uh, to Paxlovid, uh, molnupiravir would would be an option. So I think in, in conclusion, if a patient calls in with a positive test, um, you know, my approach has been, you know, first figure out, are they sick? Uh, if they're sick and need to come in right away because of significant shortness of breath, hypoxemia, altered mental status, et cetera, bring those patients in. If the patient's doing reasonably well, 
you know, minimal symptoms, maybe has a fever, but no significant dyspnea. I counsel them on, on things to watch out for. Uh, and then uh, have them measure their pulse oximetry level uh, if that's a possibility. Uh, and I also try to risk stratify who needs uh, antiviral therapy um, uh, based on their risk of uh, progression to severe illness. Um, and if patients are a candidate, uh, that's when I will refer them to uh, for one of those uh, uh, antiviral therapies. Um, with Paxlovid, generally is the first line, although, um, you know, after careful scrutiny of, of their medication list to make sure that they have no contraindication uh, to use of Paxlovid. Uh, thanks for your attention today. I appreciate you guys taking the time to listen, and I hope you found this helpful.